officially day number one, I guess. Day plus one or two if you've been to some of the co-located events. Thank you for coming. I'm Evan Gilman. I am a maintainer on uh, Spiffy and Spire projects both. Uh, I've been on those projects for uh, since, since they were started, I guess, as of five and a half years maybe or since 2017. And um, the title of the talk today is Don't Mind the Gap. We're going to be talking predominantly about how to use Spiffy identities to authenticate to third party resources, um, specifically to the three major cloud providers. There's a few tricks up our sleeve. We can talk about others have kind of clued into the trick over the last year or two, um, which some of you may have noticed. I'm trying to keep this talk as casual as possible. Um, I've got 20 slides, it's been around 20 minutes. Uh, if folks have questions, anything like that, please feel free to raise your hand in the middle of the talk. I'm happy to kind of stop and answer your questions, make it personal. I've got a mic up here, there's a mic back there, or we can shout or we'll figure it out. Um, so we'll talk first about the Spiffy basics, kind of, we won't go over all of Spiffy, but we'll go over the things that are important to understand for the content in this, in this presentation. And similar thing for Spire, we'll cover kind of at a high level some of the important things uh, that you'll, you'll need to kind of make sense of, of the rest of the talk. And then I'll step through kind of like three examples of how to do this, AWS, Azure, and GCP. They're all kind of, um, they all leverage kind of the same underlying technology, uh, but you know, have their little quirks and differences here and there uh, kind of thing. And then finally, we'll have uh, hopefully plenty of time at the end for Q and A. Uh, if nobody raises their hand during my presentation, which I hope they do. So without further ado, we can dive on, oops, wrong one, Spiffy Basics. The first thing to know about Spiffy is the Spiffy ID, and I apologize, I, I, some people here tend to be newcomers, some people tend to not be, so bear with me. And a Spiffy ID is kind of what it sounds like. It's basically like a username for workloads, when Spiffy deals with workload identity, this is kind of like the core thing. And uh, as you can see here, it's, it's like a structured string, as structured as a URI, it is compatible with 3986 or whatever that URI RFC is. Um, it does have some like additional limitations placed on top of that um, to constrain. So there's a lot of stuff in that RFC. <laughs> if you spend an adequate amount of time, you'll, you'll understand that. And uh, so there's a few kind of critical parts um, the first one is, of course, the scheme, which is Spiffy, which just kind of states this is a Spiffy ID. Uh, the second is this piece we call the trust domain. The trust domain is what I would call kind of like a security domain. You, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a trust domain name and a set of identity issuers. So when you look at a trust domain name, you should immediately know, okay, it's coming from kind of this zone or these set of issuers. And you can see because it's part of the ID, all of the Spiffy IDs are qualified by this trust domain name. And then the final piece is kind of the name of the service. And this can be, you know, you can have multiple levels in there, the same as a regular URI. You can make it hierarchical, you can make it however you want. Um, the spec doesn't say much about restricting kind of the values of these things. Um, it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure. But given the Spiffy ID, you can kind of see immediately, you know, which authority issued this identity and what is the identity of the workload that the, it's supposed to represent, right? The name of the workload it's supposed to represent. And then uh, these Spiffy IDs, they get encoded into a document. Spiffy supports two documents right now. It supports a X509 certificate, and it also supports JOT token, APM machine. And uh, so there's some spec around kind of like how you embed this ID into a cert or into a JOT and where you find it, how you validate it, all that stuff. So that's the Spiffy ID thing, and a little bit of what, what we call that document in SVID, uh, Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document. Then we have this thing called the bundle, 
the bundle is that collection of authority keys. You know, so when I talk about a trust domain, then there's some set of authorities in the trust domain that are responsible for issuing identities. You know, they have, these authorities have a set of public-private key pair. This bundle is a collection of those things. So, you know, you'll have a one bundle per trust domain, and the bundle captures all the signing keys that are authoritative for that trust domain. You can see that they're specified that this, it's for this kind of uh, uh, SVID or that kind of SVID. Uh, and, th and these can grow, you know, we do, uh, Spiffy supports root rotation this way, you know, so these can kind of grow and shrink as time goes on, you know, you can introduce a new key in advance, rotate to it, remove the old key, that kind of thing. So these bundles are kind of living and breathing in, in, in a way. Uh, and then, you know, the keys that are referenced in this bundle are then used to sign SVIDs for that trust domain. And that's how the validation happens. So then when we talk about Spiffy Federation, what does that mean? You know, that's like, hey, I want to take identities from one domain or one set of systems and talk across this boundary to another set of systems and to another domain. How does that happen? That's fairly simply just this collection of kind of bundle data that we just looked at. And you'll keep this map and you'll know, hey, a trust domain foo, there's the bundle, trust domain bar, here's the bundle. And uh, when you encounter one of these SVIDs, you can kind of do this lookup. You can say, okay, this SVID is, is this Spiffy ID, therefore it's from this trust domain. And I'll select the bundle for that trust domain to do the validation. Uh, by doing it this way, it's a lot different than like WebKKI, which has kind of a, a, a set of, you know, keys and certs handed down from on high that are good for anything kind of thing, right? Uh, Spiffy like delineates this and says, okay, we want only authorities to be good for certain aspects. And this gives the kind of isolation I had mentioned earlier, a security domain. You know, if one of these trust domains is compromised, it doesn't automatically translate into another trust domain being compromised because they're totally separate signing infrastructure and totally separate keys. So we usually see people use these trust domains, for things like staging production, Coke, Pepsi, you know, cross org, cross environment, that kind of stuff. So that's Spiffy, or the important parts for this talk at least. We'll talk a little bit about Spire for a minute. Uh, Spire is the software implementation of the Spiffy specs. So when we talk about you know, certs and trust domains and all this stuff, well, like who is signing those certs? You know, where do I get them from? All this kind of stuff, that's what Spire does. Spire is written in Go, it's designed to run in as many environments as possible. Spiffy is platform agnostic, and Spire is kind of like, what should I say, like the darling implementation of Spiffy. And so, in as much as Spiffy is intended to be run out everywhere, Spire is as well. Uh, it runs on Linux, it runs on Darwin, it'll run on your BSDs, and as of recently, it'll run on Windows too. So these are the kind of the high-level components on Spire. Spire has a server component and an agent component. The server component is the piece that does all the signing. It's got the keys. It's got all that good sensitive stuff. And then we have these agents. These agents run nominally on a per node basis and they're the ones who are actually providing the identities to the workloads, right? One of the really important things about Spiffy is that it solves this problem that we call secure introduction or a secret zero problem. So, you know, when you deploy software and it pops up, how does it speak to the first system? You know, how does it begin that first authentication process? A lot of people try to solve this through injection of credentials, baking things into containers, and all kinds of other stuff. Um, Spiffy doesn't require any of that. It, it has this concept of what we call a workload API, and that's what these agents provide. So when a workload is deployed and it pops up, it talks to these agents over this workload API. It doesn't, the workload doesn't have to have any kind of secret or anything like that, and it doesn't need a token or anything. It kind of just says, hey, who am I? And then it's the Spiffy implementation's job, in this case, Spire, to figure that out. And the end result of that process is the issuance of an identity. And so when we talk about doing this without any kind of uh, secret being necessary, a token or what have you, you kind of need a way to describe things, right? And you need, you need to declare, hey, you know, Bob is Bob, Alice is Alice. So Spire has this concept of registration. In order for a 
workload to get an identity from Spire, it must first be registered. And the registration is basically saying like, hey, look, we've got this workload, her name is Alice. She runs generally in this cluster over here. This is her general shape and, and look. She's this tall and whatnot. When you see this workload, you know that's Alice and you give her the Alice identity. So this is, uh, the, together this information is what we would call a registration, which is effectively that description. What is the workload's name? What does it look like? And where should it be running? And then the final piece of all of this Spire component stuff is what we call the Spire OIDC discovery provider. This is a separate piece of software. It's, it's shipped as part of the Spire release uh, as a supporting utility. And uh, it can run kind of next to a Spire server or next to an agent, whichever makes more sense for you. And its job is to kind of massage this spiffy bundle into something that looks a little bit like OIDC. <laughs> OIDC is a technology, I guess OpenID Connect, uh, it's a technology that was, I should say, a standard that was defined predominantly for user auth, um, but is kind of an hijacked a bit here and, and in other places too, uh, to do also kind of workload auth. And it's a very, very simple HTTP-based process, regular web TLS protection around it. So this IDC discovery provider supports Acme. So, you know, you can deploy this thing, it'll come up and, you know, it can grab a WebPKI cert and it can kind of serve these keys up for you in a public fashion. And then what it does is, is in this massaging here, uh, as you see, the, the OIDC spec is, is very, the spiffy, the bundle spec is very, very similar to the OIDC key spec. However, there are some minor divergences. And so what this OIDC discovery provider effectively does is munge this thing and expose it with a WebPKI cert. So you can see here we redacted like some of the X509 related key material. And we also redact this particular use field, which we have found uh, to be problematic with some OIDC validators. So this is kind of the final piece to like make the whole thing work end to end. So, you know, our, our previous diagram, you know, if we replace the, the right hand side with just AWS, uh, AWS can kind of stand in here and, and, and hit this Spire server and grab those keys and do validation the same way that another Spire server might be able to do this. Uh, I didn't, the, the diagram I have here doesn't show the OIDC discovery provider, but it would be running kind of in this diagram co-located with the Spire server as, as a part of its pod or something like that. And so how exactly does this work? Oopsies. Uh, AWS has this concept of a federated web identity. There's a service in AWS called the STS. I can't remember if it's simple or secure token service. I'm pretty sure it's the last two. And uh, what it enables you to do is, is, is to go and exchange a credential for an AWS credential. So what we can do using this endpoint is we can come to it with a spiffy ID, with a spiffy credential. And we can exchange the spiffy credential for a time-bound temporary AWS secret access key. And the magic about this is that, hey, you know, Spiffy doesn't require you to like store secrets on disk or do anything. It does all the stuff at runtime. It doesn't require you to do secrets injection, secrets management. Uh, anytime that you have to talk to S3, for example, you're gonna need an AWS secret access key. And there's a lot of pain around managing these things. Oftentimes they don't expire. People have MFA policies on their account, but then they have to get the non-MFA secret access keys for their workloads, because how do you do MFA with your workload? All these kinds of pains. So the way that we do this is we create this mapping, this trust relationship in AWS, and we set up uh, this web identity provider and you point it at the OIDC discovery thing that runs next to your Spire server. And once you've set this up, you can then create this mapping. Like, so here on the top, you can see that there's a role ARN. So we're, what, here what we're saying is this particular AWS IAM role is mapped to this particular Spiffy ID on the bottom right, spiffyexample.com S3 test app. And so when somebody hits STS and they've got this particular identity and this particular audience, this is the JOT token, by the way, then the caller is entitled to receive temporary credentials for the role described at the top. And this is pretty awesome because it negates the whole 
where do the keys go? Where do they live? I put them in a vault. How do they get injected? How do I rotate them? Well, would things break if I rotate them? And all this kind of stuff. Uh, so this is, this is kind of the basic trick. Uh, it is made way cooler by this little project that Square wrote. You'll notice a theme in, in, in these integrations that all three of the cloud integrations I'm talking about today have been written and published by the community. We have a really strong, wonderful community, Spiffy Spire, and people publish these kinds of things all the time and supporting code to go with it. So uh, kind of standing on the shoulders of giants and, and, and a bit in parts of this presentation. Uh, so Square has written and published this tool uh, to help you do this authentication in AWS uh, with a lot less headache. Even though we've already removed the headache of the AWS secret access key, uh, there's more headache to be removed. And the way that this works is by shipping this little utility that hooks into the standard AWS config file. And so all you bas basically all you have to do is you drop this little config file on disk, and you also drop this Spiffy AWS assume role utility on disk. And, and so long as your app uses uh, the AWS SDK to talk to S3 or Redshift or whatever else you're using. Uh, the, the logic to hook and look for this config file and call out and do all this stuff is already there. So these apps that have this AWS SDK, they can be running anywhere. They can be running on-prem, they can be running in Azure, you name it, they can be running under your desk. Uh, so long as they're able to get a, a spiffy credential, then they don't actually have to be written with the Spiffy SDK. They can just use the regular out of the box AWS SDK with this little helper utility. And what this helper utility does is it, it knows how to talk to, to the workload API, grab a Spiffy identity, go talk to STS, grab the temporary STS credential, and then return it back to the app. So we have a lot of people who have migrated apps out of AWS uh, that are none the wiser effectively because none of the app code has to be changed. All they need to do is drop these configs on disk and you're off to the races. So that's pretty cool. I'll show you a little bit about Azure. Similar thing. They have a service that you can go to and it, and it knows how to do the OIDC swap and you can bring your spiffy jot there and they can map that back to an Azure identity. This uh, blog post, Identity Digest blog, is an excellent blog. Uday, I believe, is an identity architect at Microsoft. He's been there almost a quarter century. Wrote up this really great how-to on how to use Spiffy identities to authenticate to Azure. And uh, he also published this diagram, which is kind of you know spelling out the flow that I was just describing, right? You have a Spire server, you have this OIDC thing, you've got a workload that comes up, it gets a Spiffy ID, it goes and talks to this endpoint in Azure, it does this exchange, it gets back Azure creds, and then with the Azure creds it can do whatever it wants. Now, you know that Kubernetes cluster, that big green part there, like I said, that can be anywhere, it doesn't have to be in Azure because the Spiffy identity is platform agnostic. And finally, we have GCP. Similar trick here. This is from Christoph Graz. He's an engineer on a Google Cloud team. Uh, Google Professional Services actually published this blog post and this utility, uh, which is similar to similar to the magic that Square published. This utility uh, is designed to kind of let your on-prem instances talk back to GCP without any application modification, the same way that the AWS thing does. Rather than using a file and a helper process with a callout, this integration actually turns on a proxy, and this proxy steps into the Google metadata endpoint and emulates, effectively emulates, the answers that the Google metadata endpoint would give you if you were running on Google Cloud. So similar to the AWS thing, our software can kind of pop up. It, it already, you're using the GCP SDK. It knows it can talk to this metadata API it reaches out and it finds this proxy, and this proxy has the smarts to get the Spiffy identity, go and make the exchange with GCP, and then bring back your GCP cred. Question? So if we're driving GCP cred, does the proxy have already been established? The, the question was that this diagram presupposes that trust is already established. I think that you're asking about that screen from the AWS 
Yes, it does. There's a configuration that you need to do in GCP similar to AWS where you point it back to your OIDC provider, your Spire server. There's a certificate involved there, usually web PKI certificate involved there. Um, so this, this diagram presupposes that that configuration has been done already. The, the direction, so the questionnaire is the direction of request, is it from cloud provider to Spire server, or is it Spire server to the cloud provider? Uh, well, in, in terms of the Spire server, it's Spire server to the cloud, or cloud provider to the Spire server. So the cloud provider periodically will reach the Spire server, grab the recent public keys, pull them back. The workload obviously reaches into GCP. So, you can see, you know, I, I talked earlier kind of about how it's, it's all kind of a similar underlying technology here that enables this, but different kind of nuances on each one, you know. Different cloud providers decide they want to do this thing differently, and so the way you configure them, the way you consume them kind of subtly varies uh, from case to case. However, uh, the underlying mechanism is relatively universally applicable. A lot of software supports this kind of OIDC auth. You know, so today we talk about AWS, Azure, GCP, but there's a lot of off-the-shelf software and other third-party services out there that also support OIDC auth. I hear about them all the time. Uh, and so if you're using something that supports OIDC auth that's off-the-shelf or it's a service or something like that, there's a good chance that it'll be compatible in this way. And so the key takeaways here, <laughs> number one is that Spiffy Jots are, are OIDC compatible. Um, if you look, there's like a little logo. It's like an O with an I and a little circle thing. Uh, a lot of these software support OIDC already, and those that do, you, it's like a 90, 99% chance, 90, 95% chance that it's just gonna work out of the box. Uh, Spiffy and Spire are both platform agnostic. They can run anywhere. Spire is super, super pluggable. Uh, so all the kinds of things that Spire needs to rely on underlying platforms are all pluggable. So there's AWS plugins, there's plugins to interact with hardware TPMs, there's plugins to do all this different kind of stuff. Um, so the, the, the real thing here is that you know, a lot of times access to these services has been kind of gated by where, where you're running your workload and that is no longer. If you want to use the Google machine learning stuff from inside your data center, you can do that very easily and you don't have to fool around with any of these keys. Uh, and yeah, so that's one weird trick to avoid the, all the pain and management around kind of managing these tokens, storing them, encrypting them, injecting them, all this stuff. All the Spiffy identities are all kind of short-lived, fast rotated, everything's fully automated from the root down. Uh, so this problem kind of just vanishes. If you wanna learn more about this stuff, we have obviously our GitHub repos. Uh, these are a couple of the repos I talked about today uh, with the helper utility from AWS and, and Square and also the helper utility from Google Cloud Platform uh, to do Spiffy off from anywhere. That's all I have for you today. Open up for questions. I'll leave this up for a minute. Folks want to take pictures, and I've got a QR code for talk feedback. Thank you for coming. It's great to see you all. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So I'm in the process of trying to cook up a Spire deployment for my environment right now. And the challenge I'm, coming, I'm encountering is that the list of trust domains keeps growing and growing and growing. And so there's also, a, appears to me, a tight relationship between trust domain and Spire deployment. So let's say I'm going to have 50 trust domains. Now I have to manage 50 Spire server deployments. Yeah. Are there any plans to consider consolidating multiple trust domains in, in one server deployment, so I don't have to, like, I'm fixing one problem that I'm creating an operational uh, burden on the other hand. Is there any advice or thoughts around that? Yes. Well, I have some thoughts, I don't know about advice. <laughs> um, the, the kind of exploding trust domain problem is a problem that I've seen a number of times, particularly at shops of larger scale. 
Uh, you know, I think this also kind of comes down to a trade-off, you know. There are some tricks you can do. So the first thing is that, you know, Spire Server can be deployed in what we call as nested model, so you can have multiple Spire clusters participating in one larger trust domain. Oftentimes, people reach for many trust domains because this is kind of like the easy thing to do with their model. For example, if I'm just stamping out a bunch of kind of like equivalent spy, uh, Kubernetes clusters, the easiest thing to do oftentimes is just to say, okay, well, each one of these is its own trust domain. Um, there, are, there are drawbacks with that, you know. This federated auth we talked, I talked about earlier where you look at the trust domain and you choose the correct bundle. I mean, Envoy support, supports this natively, other software support this natively, but not everyone does. You know, Nginx doesn't, and a couple others. So anytime that you talk about this federated auth, already you're kind of talking about a cost. The, the other piece of this is that each one of these bundles, there's a size, <laughs> and when you have a lot of them, they get quite large, and there's a lot of network traffic involved in that, and the agents suck these things down. And, uh, so, you know, I, we're, we're exploring ways to kind of make this problem better. We do have, like, the largest Spire deployments are over a million agents, so they're, like, way, way bigger than largest Kubernetes deployments. Um, so these things can be done, but we tend to see usually these really large deployments go for like two, three, four trust domains kind of thing. And then they lean on kind of these nested architectures and other kind of tree-like topologies to, to achieve the scale and, and reliability that their deployments need. So I would say, I guess, I guess my advice would just be like, hey, you know, the trust domain thing is kind of like a big hammer and like, Kind of go about it as like put put it in the places where you really need it, and not the places where, you know, that's just kind of the easiest thing to deploy. I, I hope that makes sense. Without knowing more about your environment, it's hard to make a, a more concrete. Yeah. Would you be opposed to one large trust domain and the receiver of the, of the credential, like looking at the latter part of the SPIFI ID and like dissecting that, because it's minted in. So like, if you want an environmental segmentation, would you like would it be okay to have one large domain, but? Let's say our receiver is only in like a staged environment and they could look at a, a bit in the URI to say, oh, this is staging and then authorize on that. Do you think, is that an anti-pattern according, uh, according to you? Uh, you definitely want to check the workload ID. I mean, there are some services that it's okay to just say like anything from staging, but in general, you really want to check the workload ID. I, the things I think about like NTP, DNS, th things that are like centralized services, you know, that makes sense for, but I would recommend like the, the trust the trust domain name should be part of your authorization policy, but so should the workload ID. Thanks. Hey, um, I think I have a small question. So as I understand from the spiral registration to the SPIFI is free ID. Uh, it is kind of a, a, a fixed one-to-one -one mapping that you specify, uh, specify a, a, a list of selectors and, and that is mapped to a specific SPIFI ID. I wonder, is there any plans to make this mapping a little bit more flexible and uh, dynamic? Uh, for example, by uh, it could be as simple as some like a format a substitution or maybe a limited expression aggregate there. So that with a single spiral registration that can be used to uh, map to uh, like maybe a thousand or hundred or like SPIFI ID for a thousand and hundred of workloads. Let me make sure I understood your question. Uh, you were asking, you were asking if it's possible, like if we've been thinking about having Spire break away from this kind of like one registration to one workload ID pattern and instead like be able to configure Spire with a regex or something that would then issue identities um, from that or? Yeah, that something like that. Maybe a more concrete example is, for example, I have a selector service name, uh, the value could be anything and I want to embed that service value into the specific ID so that I do not need to repeat that value part. You do not want to repeat what, I'm sorry? Uh, like a, a, a the selector, like a, a mm, uh, the yeah. value of that, like a service yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the problems that we have is with this is the security model. So, Spire is designed to survive node compromise. Uh, 
So if you know any node in the Kubernetes cluster or any physical node or otherwise is compromised, the security model is such that you know there's an agent running there. The security model is such that you cannot just take control of this agent and go mint any identity you want. Uh, and in order to put that security control in place, you kind of have to know which agents are authorized to mint which identities. And so it, it's difficult to kind of say, hey, this agent can mint you know, any of foo or var namespace identity because you still need, kind of need mappings for that. And oftentimes the agent identity is like very disjoint from the namespace of the workload. And so this is something that I've been thinking about personally, like, what could we do to avoid kind of this registration overhead, you know? In, in Kubernetes, uh, we have what's the Spire Controller Manager, which is a controller that can watch its deployments as they're placed and will automatically manage all these registration entries for you. And you can kind of annotate or label uh, these deployments with spiffy IDs that you would like them to take on. And so some of this overhead is, is negated in that way, but I think there's more we can do. And, Right now, some of the core kind of core core design and security principles of Spire make it difficult. I, I don't know if that's exactly what <laughs> you were asking, but I feel that it's something related to like registration management and like defining identities for large number of workloads in advance and this kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So in the examples that you showed, it looked like you're effectively swapping your Spiffy ID for a like short-lived cloud credential. So is there kind of any work going on or any interest in like the cloud provider supporting SVIDs like natively so you wouldn't have to do the dance? Um, I have not heard of this, but you see that, you know, this, TCP answer was written by Google Cloud. Uh, AWS has also began to, like AWS App Mesh has native integration with Spire, so you can bring your Spire and plug it into AWS App Mesh. Uh, so I haven't seen cloud providers directly trying to pick up Spiffy off, maybe in the future they will. Um, but we, what we do see them is we do see them kind of engaging and making this story better. Any more questions? Thanks, everyone. Oh, one more. One more, one more. Sorry, false start, false start. <laughs> I, I think you skipped in the talk, but there is a process in AWS to get the trust of the OIDC provider. So what is the, like the OIDC provider for, um, for the Spiffy identity? Like how, how does that connection get? Uh, so, you have your Spire server, and your OIDC provider, you can ship it kind of in the same pod. The OIDC provider talks to Spire server, it gets all the bundle data. And then it kind of turns on a little web server that serves the OIDC discovery document and a few other kind of documents to make OIDC work, and it also munges these this bundles to be kind of like aligned with the format that OIDC validators expect. It speaks ACME and grabs a web PKI cert and so when you configure your cloud provider to talk back to this OIDC provider, part of this step is saying, you know, here's the DNS name, you are expecting web PKI. Some of the clouds like AWS, for example, will say like, hey, like paste in the thumbprint of the actual cert that you're serving over there and we'll validate that thing. Um, so that's how the trust between the provider, the cloud provider and the OIDC on-prem stuff. All right, thanks everyone.